Welcome to the John Freakin' Muir Pod. Lace up those boots and sling on the pack for a romp through trails, short and long. With your host and renaissance man, Doc, it's time to embrace the suck. Welcome back to another week on the trail, dirtbags and hiker trash. I'm Doc, and this is the John Freakin' Muir Pod. Let's start off with a reminder. If you are enjoying the podcast, take just a minute, help us out, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're not enjoying the pod, well, just go ahead and keep that to yourself. All right. This week, we are talking to a peak bagger with an extraordinary resume. Joining us from the Northeastern United States today is Michael Cole. Welcome to the John Freakin' Muir Pod. Michael, how's it going? It's going really good. Thank you for having me. And as as we are speaking, it is about six p.m. here on the east on the west coast, and you are up past your bedtime. So I, I appreciate you uh, staying awake and and being able to talk to me tonight. Yeah, no, if I nod off, just I don't know what you do when people nod off, but do it. But I'm I'm not going to nod. Off. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll try and keep it entertaining so you stay awake. <laughs> okay, that's, that's partly my job too. I think. <laughs> Now you are you are a friend of two previous guests on the podcast, aren't you? I am. And uh, who would those who would those guests be? Yeah, you you would know them as uh, the professor and Stretch, and I guess they're known jointly as the Suffer Buddies. Um, and they were on your podcast. I want to say June or July of twenty two. That's right. The Suffer Buddies, Kucharski and Kenosh, I believe, are the, are the last names there. That, that's them. That's them. Yeah. Um, I hike with them. I, I hike with Mike Kucharski more than Jason. Um, but we've been on a few. We've actually been on a few pretty decent hikes. Um, I don't suffer as much as I suffer in different ways. I suffer trying to keep up with them because they're both like over six feet, closer to like six, three. And I'm I used to be five seven, and now I'm like five six. So they have a <laughs> they have a long stride. So I suffer to keep up. They're suffer. You know, they like to do like twenty and twenty five mile, thirty mile hikes a day, and I don't join them on those. Yeah, that that's just a lot more steps for us shorter guys, right? I mean, they that's they've right. got long strides. They can cover a lot of ground. And and be forewarned, you younger people out there that when you do get to be our age, you, you tend to shrink a little bit. Your spine compresses. You're not as tall as you used to be. Yeah. You could deny it as much as you want, but it's true. Yeah. When my, my kids asked me, how tall are you? I said, well, I used to be five, nine and a half. I I'm, I'm yeah. sure I'm not, I'm not quite there anymore. <laughs> so. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> well, in your travels with Kucharski and Kenosh, did you pick up a trail name? So, um, I'm not a through hiker. I've done a fair amount of hiking on the Appalachian Trail, but I'm not a section hiker. So, the technical answer to your question is, I do not have a trail name. But I did know that you were going to ask me that question. Um, some of my hiking crew does refer to me as... It's not a good trail name, but they call me the Wilderness Father. That's a lot of syllables right there. I know. That's why it's not a good, it's not a good trail name. <laughs> um, but that's about as close as you're going to get. But I don't know if you want to refer to me as that during the podcast, because that takes a lot of time. Wilderness Father. What, what if we shorten that to just Pops? Yeah, that would probably be apropos. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we'll we'll try out a couple of things tonight. All right, we'll we'll see okay. what uh, what feels good, what what sticks. Uh, I'll start off with pops, and we'll see if from your stories and experiences, we can we can maybe pick something else. Okay, fair enough. All right, hey pops, have you listened to the podcast before? I've listened to the the Suffer Buddy episodes, and I've listened to a few others just to kind of make sure I had my I was a little oriented before we started. So you knew what you were getting into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. Well, knowing your change, your, unless you're changing the flipping the script or changing the script, you know, knowing your former profession, I, I wouldn't expect any less. I, I would expect you, you to do your research and be prepared coming in. Uh huh. Yes, that's so, correct. 
I only ask because I want to make sure that you are familiar uh, with an episode, uh, an episode, a segment we have towards the end of the episode called the Pro Tip Insight of the Week. That's where I will turn Mm -hmm. to you and ask you to share some trail wisdom with our listeners to make their next experience even better. Okay. Um, I'm prepared for that. Okay, good. And, you know, feel free to drop trail wisdom throughout the episode, but uh, but don't use up that one that you're prepared to, to give at the end. You'll still be on the hook for that at the end. Okay. All right. I, I have a few, so I could. Review. Oh, oh, sorry. Half calf uh, talked over you there. What'd you, what'd you say, Pops? I said, uh, I have a few, a, a little bit of trail wisdom. So if I drop one early, I'll still have one in my pocket. Okay. All right. Okay. So that, that was half calf a little bit earlier, and she is reminding us that uh, it is time to do the must bring gear review sponsored by the ultralight backpacking gear company, Six Moon Designs. And here's how it works. If you were to let a stranger pack your bag with pretty much generic gear for a multi-day hike, what is the one specific piece of gear you would insist on being packed? And if you've got a particular brand for that specific piece of gear, even better. So Pops, what is your must bring piece of gear out there when you're with the supper buddies? Okay. Um, I do hiking all year round, but my, what I really prefer uh, is winter hiking. And so uh, with the risk that you've probably heard this before, I I would say my must uh, bring piece of gear has to be micro spikes. Um, I used to use Catula micro spikes, but if you know anything about micro spikes, you know, as opposed to crampons, you really can't sharpen micro spikes. Once they kind of get dull, you throw them out. So my Catulas are kind of kaput and I've switched to um hill sound uh trail crampon which i think are i, I kind of like them better but regardless um for hiking in the whites in the adirondack um and the appalachian trail in the winter uh it's a you have to have your traction okay and for our listeners out there who may be unfamiliar with winter hiking and what uh, micro spikes and crampons are what are the what, what's the difference between micro spikes and crampons. Okay, so my, my uh, crampons are really more for uh, what I would classify as serious mountaineering, glacier, uh, a little bit more of a uh, uh, an angled ascent. Um, they'll often have two points or uh, spikes in the front, so you can actually uh, pick your toes right into. Um, uh, into the ice if you're going up something that's really steep they're a little bit less pliable crampons longer spikes 10 to 12 spikes per uh per per, uh, foot um and you usually you could strap them on or you could clip them on the micro spikes are much more user friendly they can go you could put them on trail runners you could put them on you could put them on sneakers you could put them on winter boots you just kind of slide them on. They have like this rubberized um, uh, stretch kind of material that will just pull right over your boot. They probably have about 12 to 15 spikes, but they're smaller. So a crampon might have a one inch spike. Uh, a Petula micro spike may have a half inch. The ones that I use, the the um, Hill Sounds have like a two thirds of an inch. So that's why I like them. They're a little bit more aggressive. Um, they're just a great piece of gear for uh, uh, lower angled, less of an incline uh, going up and going down. Um, and in, in winter, you got to have, you just have to have. Yeah. More serious Pops. climbs. Yeah. More serious climbs, I'll use crampons. So Pops, would it be fair to say that if you're going to do some winter hiking, you really need to know the environment you're going into and make sure that you're prepared. I mean, we've heard stories on this on this podcast of folks who maybe did not have uh, crampons or micro spikes or an ice axe, and they find themselves in situations that are literally life and death situations. Hundred uh, percent, and I see it almost every time I'm out, especially when I'm in the White Mountains, um, which could be pretty nasty. I mean, a lot of hikers, a lot of climbers, serious mountaineers. So I've climbed out in the Cascades and I've climbed in, in Alaska and I've climbed up in 
uh, the lower Cascades in, in California. But anyways, a lot of mountaineers will train in the winter um, up in the presidentials in New Hampshire because, I mean, it's the worst weather in the world. Uh, and I've seen just about every hike, especially in the winter, I've seen people in hoodies, in sneakers, in trench coats, uh, with book bags, and you name it, I've seen it. And you just kind of shake your head. And sometimes it's to the point where, if, especially if I'm coming down and I know what it's like above tree line and I see somebody heading up, you know, we'll kind of like pull them aside and say, you might want to rethink this because it's pretty serious up there. Um, so, yeah, you definitely have to be watching the weather and you have to be smart enough to know that if it's going to be bad, the mountain's always going to be there. You come back another day. Um, and you know, uh, we bring our GPS, we bring our backup, we bring our uh, map, we bring our compass, um, and we do our homework. We check the avalanche report if it's if we're traveling in avalanche terrain. Um, and so, yeah, you, you just have to do it. I mean, you could be lucky. I mean, nine times, most times, you're going to be lucky and you're going to make it if you're not prepared. But I'd rather be prepared. And in the whites, I mean, the last in, in the last several months, there's been people who've lost their lives up there who were not. Here. Yeah, I, I've heard about some stories in the Whites, and also uh, down here in Southern California, we we've got some some peaks that are snow covered uh, right now, like Mount Baldy. There's been a number of folks who have have uh, ended up um, on the short end of the stick on Mount Baldy right now. I know they're looking for an actor as we as we record this right now. There's been an actor who has gone missing in the Mount Baldy area about two weeks ago. And they they're still looking, and in, in the course of looking for him, they found a couple of other bodies. I mean, it's a it is a dangerous situation if you are if you don't have the right equipment. It could be it could be dangerous. Yeah. And that's you know, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I like um, winter hiking so much. I mean, it's it's definitely um, a little bit more on the risk continuum, which makes it a little bit more exciting. Um, but you got to be smart about it because my wife would be really pissed. If, uh... All right. We are early in the episode talking about the risk continuum. So this is this is going to be a good episode, I can tell already. Okay, good. I like continuums. It's the hawking pole. All right. To help us determine uh, your your total, um, where, where you fall on the risk continuum, this is the hiking pole. Mm -hmm. And that's pole, P-O-L-L, -L, like a survey. This is a seven-question survey. That's going to help me give you a score on the sanity scale from one to a hundred with one being completely insane and 100 being completely sane. You ready for this? All right. I am ready. Okay. What, what would, uh, what would the, how would the professor rank you on the sanity scale? Where, where would he say you fall? Oh, he'd say, I'm, I'm like a 90. Very sane. Yeah. So okay. they call me the wilderness father. That's right. So, <laughs> so you understand the risk. You understand the risk continuum, and you take the proper precautions as much as you can, right? I mean, because there's always that little bit of an unknown. I try. I let's say I I do try. Okay. Now this this survey is completely subjective. Your score at the end will be derived upon whether or not I agree with you. Okay. And I get to do that because I'm the host. I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's start off easy here. First question. Uh, trekking poles or no trekking poles out there while you're peak bagging? Uh, um, it's a long pause. Poles, That's a long pause, I know, pause I know. already. Uh, let, me, yeah. let me mark that down. Okay, go ahead. Trekking poles nine times out of 10 on the way up. Um usually on the way down but sometimes they kind of get in the way on the way down you, you know on the one hand my old aching knees kind of could use the trekking poles kind of reduce the shock but a lot of times they're kind of just getting the way um but i would say i am a trekking pole okay all right question number two what's on the feet boots or trail runners boots i'm a boot guy you're a boot guy if it's yeah, so in the winter, if I'm going above tree line, it's double plastic boots. What, what are uh, double plastic? And 
Tell me about double plastic boots. Uh, well, they're mountaineering boots. So there's there's an insert. Um, it's like, kind of like a poly foam insert. Goes inside the boot. The outside is just a big pla It's a plastic shell. Um, and there's this. Uh, it's not a neoprene liner, but it almost looks a little bit like a neoprene liner that slides into the boot. Keeps your feet warm as hell. They're a little clunky. They're great for attaching crampons to. Um, give you pretty good traction. So a lot of mountaineers will use them. Plastic boots are kind of old school. There's a synthetic kind that's new. They're a little bit more comfortable, but they're more expensive. I didn't feel like springing for it. Um, but I've had my pair, I don't know, 10 years now. So they're really good for uh, overnights in uh, uh, pretty severe winter conditions because what you can do is you take the the, the liner out because your feet sweat, right? If you just have a, a single liner boot, it's going to freeze at night and it's going to be miserable the next morning when you slide your foot in. The double boot, you take the liner out and you stick it in the sleeping bag with you and it's nice and toasty in the morning when you put it back on. So that's a that's a, a winter above tree line boot. Below tree line boot is just a, a insulated boot. The rest of the year, I'm kind of in a solo fugitive mid you know, ankle high boot okay now, you, that's what i'm no trail runners do you still have all 10 toes yeah well it's it's tough to argue with that then i mean I, I was gonna mark you down but you know if you've got 10 toes and you're hiking in that kind of that kind of environment i mean it kind of makes sense like i said i'm a 90 <laughs> all right hey question number three do you ever do any overnights out there um, I've, uh, um, you know, I've done overnights, you know, in Alaska, in the Cascades, um, in the Whites, not as much, more day hikes. Or okay. if we're stay, staying out, a lot of times we'll stay at a, at a hut, mm -hmm. which are cold, but they're, you know, it's, there's a shelter. Right. So on the overnights, question number three is, what do you use for your shelter system? Is it a tent, tarp, hammock, bivy, or cowboy camping? This, I guess this is the winter edition of the hiking pole. So this is okay. This winter edition. I use a um, inflatable. I use inflatable pad. Then I use a uh, closed foam cell pad on top of that. No, actually, the, that that goes underneath. Then the inflatable pad. Then the zero degree sleeping bag, and then the tent. Okay, so it is a tent. It's a tent. Definitely a tent in the winter conditions. I mean, I've slept, uh, maybe we'll get into this down the line. I I have slept in snow trenches and snow caves before, but only uh, when told to. Okay, let's put a pin in that because I do want to talk about that later. So don't forget about that. All right. All right. So that was question number, number three. You also answered question number four because you said, I was going to ask sleeping bag or quilt. You say sleeping bag. And- is it rated to, did you say zero degrees? Zero degree. Yeah. Zero degrees. Down or synthetic? Down. Well, when I was in Alaska a year and a half ago, I wish I had a 20 degree because <laughs> it wasn't fun. It was cold. You wish you had a, a 20 or a minus 20? Minus 20. Minus 20. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. Now, how about when it comes to food out there? Are you stove, cold soak, or stoveless? Um, I am pretty uh, Spartan when it comes to food. I will usually take uh, some freeze-dried food with, with the stove. I'm a stove guy. Okay. Um, but, you know, I have been known back in the day to eat my uh, meals right out of the can cold. I, don't, I actually kind of... I don't mind it as long as yeah, I don't mind it. Sometimes I even like it. What's your go-to freeze-dried meal out there? Uh, kind of like a pad thai. Oh, okay. You yeah. have all the things that I was expecting to come out of your mouth. Pad thai was not one of them. That, that's interesting. It's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. In the morning is oatmeal. You know, um, maybe I'll throw some almonds or some raisins or some whatever in it but yeah for dinner um 
for dinner, it's usually like a pad thai kind of a thing. I like it. I like it. All right. Question. And number... the good, the good thing about the winter. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Good thing about the winter is what? Nature's refrigerator. So you could bring, you know, meat, chicken, uh, uh, you know, beef, like a shredded beef, that kind of thing. It doesn't go bad, you know? Yeah, so. you bring you bring that side of beef out there with you, and not worry about it, it going bad. You, you go the whole. That's where, the, yeah, that's where the suffer buddies come from. Like they <laughs> they carry my heavy stuff. It's in their name. They should suffer. Right. All right. Question number six: Is life better above or below the tree line? Above. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's 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 like walking on the moon in the winter time. Mm -hmm. Not that I've ever been on the moon, but. Um, it's just, you can't describe it. I mean, you'll take videos and people will look at it on Facebook or on your phone and they'll be like, oh, that's cool. And you hear the wind whistling and you can kind of see the snow fl flying horizontally. But uh, until you're like standing in it, it's amazing. It's brutal, but it's amazing. It's a certain certain attraction to that that level of desolation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'd much rather do a hike where there's a little bit of an adventure than a, a bluebird day in the winter. Yeah, something a little bit further down on the risk continuum. I guess so. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe your maybe your your trail name is Risky. A little bit of a thrill seeker, I guess. Yeah, I like it. Okay. Last question: What's more important, pack weight or luxury items? Pack weight is more important than luxury items, but I always take more than I need. So I don't mind humping the uh, the heavier weight. A lot most times, whatever I'm, you know, the extras are just in the bag, but they're there in case I need it. But uh, um, so I don't know where that leaves me. If that's <laughs> luxury or uh, or pack weight, <laughs> yeah. I take. They're not luxury items that I'm you know, dragging around for the most part, yeah. except every once in a while, you know, a few 16 ounce beers and a, and a flask might find their way in. And I, I will, I will, I will hike that. As, as you should. Absolutely. Now I, have, I have found with um, former military guys, and I know you're in the military. I have found with former military guys that they, they like to have a backup or even a, a backup for the backup, you know, just to be, just in case to be prepared. Yeah. We had old saying two is one. You've heard this, and yes. one is none. That's um, right. And yes, it's true. Now, pops, do you, do you pack your fears? Do I pack my fears? Yes. F e a r s. That's correct. That's correct. You know, there's a tendency in the hiking community to pack your fears. If you you if you're afraid of uh, running out of water or running out of food or afraid of being cold, you you, you tend to overpack in those areas. You take more than you should. And it's because it's because of what you fear. Okay, um, maybe a little bit when it comes to the hands. I mean, I'll take more different kinds of gloves with me, and you know, hand warmers um, because that's the one. Like I said, my boots are great. Uh, my layering system is great, but I'm always a little bit concerned about the hands. Uh, so maybe I take a few extra pair of gloves, and I probably need to, but they don't weigh that much, so. All right. Well, we have your answers. I need now to put your answers through the John Freaking Mirpod algorithm to come up with a okay. score. I do a little math here. So we have to, let's see, I got to carry the two, going to multiply by pi, divide by root three, and we're going to adjust for the wind chill of minus 80 at the top of Mount Washington a few weeks back. It's a good day. Yeah. 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 And I come up with, you know, a fairly sane score of 72. I told you, that's kind of where I thought I would kind of end up. Yeah, your wife wouldn't be surprised? Yeah. She'd be happy. No, she wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> she comes on some of these, too. Um, there's a few stories there, too. <laughs> but uh, she's a good she's a good trooper. Do you, have, do you have a trail name for her? Be careful. Uh, be careful. She might be listening. She's, yeah, I, I don't have a trail name. Okay, that's that's probably for the best. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
You almost had me say something I probably regretted. So <laughs> I do not have a trail name for her. And I and I would have told you, oh, don't worry about that. We can edit that out. And then I would have left it yeah. in for you. Yeah. Nice. All right. Hey, uh, Pops, before we get too far down the trail, how, how is Pops feeling? Is that is it, is it kind of growing on you or you want, we want to keep looking? I kind of like it. Short, sweet, kind of yeah. captures the, uh, the wilderness father vibe, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So Pops, before we get too far down the trail or too, too high up towards the peak, let's uh, back up a little bit. Love to hear about uh, where you grew up, you play sports and hobbies uh, when you were in high school and what, uh, how did you get involved in the, in the outdoor adventure cult? Yeah. So, uh, high school, I'm from uh, Connecticut, um, Southern Connecticut originally, um, near New Haven, near Yale, um, football in high school, uh, college football first year, but I was too small. We could, then I went to cross country running, which that sucked. Um, and then I found my niche in, uh, playing rugby and then um in college now, in Ithaca, hang, on, hang on pops hang on pops Gee, I, I don't want to gloss you, over i don't want to gloss over rugby because i i've got some some friends who have played in the past and it looks like a a fascinating sport i'm very familiar with american football how I, I, there is some similarity but what what are the big differences between rugby and football well for one you don't have a helmet um or shoulder pads um, you play the whole game. Um, the only way you can get out is an injury. There are no substitutes. Um, uh, it's you got to. The, the best part of uh, rugby is the parties after the rugby game, because you 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 go out and you party with the opposing team, um, which you don't do when you're playing, you know, high school or in college football. Um, so it's a great it's a great. Um, uh, sport. It's an intense sport and it's, there's just a lot of camaraderie and a lot of fun. Yeah. The fact that they don't wear helmets and they don't wear shoulder pads. Do you think that that lessens the safety or it increases the safety? Because what I see in American football, especially at the college and pro levels, you, because they have that equipment on, they are lowering their heads and just trying to, you know, deliver huge, huge hits. And that ends up with people getting hurt. I think I think the fact that rugby players don't have helmets or face masks or shoulder pads, that kind of, you know, they're not going to lead with their head. They're not going to, they're not going to do the same kind of damage. Am I, I, am I wrong in thinking? No, no, I think I agree. I mean, there's not a lot of head hunting in, in rugby. I and mean, every once in a while you might get clotheslined, but um, there's no head to head unless it's by accident. Um, they're not really using your head to tackle like you do in football, using your shoulders. You know, uh, you're really going for the lower body. Uh, maybe not so much the lower. Either part, every part of the body is fair game. But I think, um, I mean, I had a couple of concussions playing um, rugby, but that's because I caught a knee in the head, not because, you know, I was hitting somebody with my head. Um, but I think overall, you'll see less injury, or less okay. si significant injury. All right, I'm glad we agree on that. You've just got, you've just gone up to a 74. Yep, thank you. Okay, maybe we'll get to 90. Could be, could be. We'll see how it goes. But I interrupted you. Tell tell us tell us more about your background. Oh yeah, so um, maybe my first real significant, I guess, outdoor experience was when I was going to school in Ithaca. I went to Ithaca College, which is across the street, so to speak, from Cornell. Used to hang out at Cornell a lot, and um, Back in the day, you know, before we had the internet, the way you advertise yourself is you hung stuff in a, you know, on a bulletin board in a, in a public place. And there was a, a, a sign, there was this Cornell professor, he was a veterinarian, who said he would take, if you're interested, he would take you to the Shawana Gunks, Gunks in um, New York and teach you how to rock climb. Uh, he had this big van. So me and my buddies just, you know, pulled a little chit off the sign and called him up on the phone and said, you know, would you take us? And he's like, absolutely. You know, and he piles you into his van and he takes you down to the gunks and he teaches you how to rock climb. 
um, and we'd go shoot pool and drink after the, you know, every night. Um, and so I kind of fell in love with rock climbing. I'm not much of a rock climber, but that kind of got me into the outdoors. And then after college, we were in the Marine Corps, and that's kind of where I really started getting into the outdoors because I got, I had to. <laughs> had I was to. an infantry. I was an infantry officer, so that's great. I had a pack yeah. on my back. You know, Pops, you just lost a whole generation of our listeners when you talked about a message board and tearing off the the chits at the bottom. They have they have no frame of reference for that. They they're like, I know, but I'm I'm watching you, and you did. Oh, I did absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Let's talk about about uh, your military experience. What what branch of of the military are you in? I was in the Marine Corps. Hoorah. Hoorah. Simplify. <laughs> And, and that was uh, what years? How long were you in? Uh, I was active duty 1981 through 85. And then I was active reserves from like 85 to maybe 80, 88 or 89. Then I went to law school. So I got I got out. Um, okay. I was in active reserves for a little while, but yeah. Any, any deployments? Oh, yeah. I was to, I went to Westpac's. Western Pacific, so Okinawa, Japan, Korea, uh, Philippines, uh, been to Panama, deployed to Norway, went to a pretty cool school in Norway for winter warfare, um, and I might be forgetting a couple. I spent more time overseas than at Camp Lejeune. Nice. Now, first of all, thank you for, for your service. Um, tell us a little bit about the Winter Warfare School in Norway. Okay, so my battalion was going to be participating in an exercise. I think it was Teamwork, Teamwork 84 or 85. And that's a, a, a joint exercise with a lot of our NATO partners. And since we were going to be going over to Norway, they um, there are a few slots for infantry officers to go and learn winter warfare from the best in the world, which were the Norwegians. And so there's this school in a little town called Elverum, Norway, which is like on the Norwegian-Swedish border. And I got tagged to go for my battalion, along with maybe two or three of my buddies. And the Norwegians teach it once a year, I think, in English. And so it was Marines, uh, British Mandos, Dutch, Danes, Germans, Swiss. I might have forgotten a few. And you know, and, and what they it, and it's like a six or seven week course. And you get there and you dump all your gear and they give they reissue you Norwegian gear. And for the first week, they teach you how to ski on what we used to call NATO planks. It's kind of it's kind of like a backcountry, cross-country ski. And then they teach you how to live and maneuver and fight in the cold. And that's kind of where the snow trench and the snow cave came into uh, uh, into effect. And um, ate Norwegian rations, which are almost inedible. Uh but it was a great, it was a great experience, you know. I mean, it was just really cool. Uh, we had reindeer running through our camp, and the Norwegians eat some weird stuff, but uh, they're very, you know, they're very nice people, and just a great experience. So we we were there for six or seven weeks while the battalion was doing its training in the states, and then it kind of shipped over uh, by by ship, and we met them when they right out, right outside of Norway for the exercise. Now, Pops, they always say that uh, all, the Norwegian countries, the Scandinavian countries always rank high in terms of level of happiness, you know, happy with their lives and happy the way everything is going. And you would think that in the Scandinavian countries that their their rations would be a lot more edible because that, that you know, the the almost inedible rations would would indicate to me it's a certain level of unhappiness. Well, these are the Norwegian soldiers. I mean, the Norwegian people are probably very happy. The Norwegian soldiers, uh, I don't know, maybe they like it. It was like freeze-dried sawdust. <laughs> it was just, it had a ton of calories. You know, it probably had like five or 6,000 calories 
uh, in a in a meal. And what we would do in the morning when we we're out in the field, you know, you're sleeping in a tent, you'd get up in the morning, zero six, zero sevens. Can I say friggin'? It's friggin' cold. Um, you, and you can and say the, friggin'. It's too yeah. cold. Okay, it's too cold to eat. So you break down your camp, you pack up, and you'd ski for like three or four miles cross country ski until your body got warm, and then you'd stop, and then you'd have your breakfast. Um, and by then you're so hungry, and you have everything kind of stuffed in your body, like your water, so then freezing. You can kind of wolf it down. But. Yeah, I can kind of see the wisdom in that because you know, pops. When I'm at a good, when I'm having a good meal, I am really focused on the food. I'm enjoying it. I'm having good conversation. I'm not really paying attention to what's going on around me. So the the Norwegian soldiers in this winter warfare school, I mean, they're good at what they do because they don't pay any attention to the food. They, 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 you know, sometimes they don't even eat. They, they it's so bad they don't eat. They're just gonna do their job and get it done. Yeah. They're very good at it. Um, they're very good teachers. Um, I, I made a couple of great friends between the Norwegians and the, the different nation, uh, nationalities that I was uh, training with. Um, incredible experience and beautiful country. Um, yes, I mean, I want to go back. Uh, my wife and I are actually talking about going back, but we, we won't sleep in a snow cave. <laughs> At least I, thought that was part of, I thought that was part of the allure. Nah. He's just, <laughs> he likes a bathroom. <laughs> Got, it. Got it. Enough said. Now, you didn't only just participate in winter warfare school. You also participated in mountain warfare school and jungle warfare school. Yeah. Try, try saying uh, that three times fast. I could barely get that out of, out of my mouth. That was good. Yeah. Um, mountain warfare school is in uh, Korea. Mm-hmm. Um, and jungle warfare school was in Panama and as, as uncomfortable as winter warfare school and mountain warfare school are jungle warfare school just sucks the most, just the worst being in the jungle. You could have that. That's just, there's just no fun there. You're always wet. Because it always rains for a couple hours, and then it's so humid you never dry out. And there's there's so many things that could just like mess up your day in the jungle. You know, in the in the cold you get cold, but in the jungle there's poisonous ants and frogs and snakes and sloths and monkeys, and it's just just a mess. Okay, so in the suckiness on the suckiness continuum. I want you to to place these these different uh, items. I want you to, to w w winter warfare school, mountain warfare school, jungle warfare school, and hiking with Kucharski. W w where do those fall on the the suckiness continuum? Okay, uh, suckiness. So, jungle warfare school sucks the most. Most sucky. Okay, so that's the furthest right on the continuum. Then you've got winter warfare school that's the next worst not warfare school is actually kind of fun and where do we stick kucharski and, and panache uh i'd put them i i like those guys they're they're all the way all the way to the left they're far easy. left far left far got left. it yeah. nice yeah all yeah. right if i hey, yeah you mentioned earlier that you you got out of the military and went to law school how did how did that whole law experience pan out for you? Where where did that particular path take you? Yeah, I had a good career. Um, I'm retired now. Uh, I retired in October of 21, but um, so I started out as a federal prosecutor with the United States Department of Justice in New York, and I did primarily uh, anti criminal antitrust cases and some criminal um, tax cases. But the commute was two hours each way because I lived in Connecticut. Uh, and that was New York City. And so I did that for about six years. And I vowed that I would never actually add up how much time I spent on the train and the subway. And I still haven't to this day because it would be very depressing. Um, and then I moved uh, careers and then I um, 
went with the Connecticut Attorney General's office. Uh, and I was a civil prosecutor. Uh, with DOJ, I was criminal and civil. And I ended up running the um, the last 16 years of my career. I ran the antitrust department. And then for the last six years, I ran the antitrust department and the, actually, the last eight years, antitrust and the government program fraud department, which is primarily healthcare fraud. Um, so I was basically a prosecutor my whole career. Had some pretty good cases. Uh, had some great people that worked with me, and uh, it was great, good experience. Well, thank you again for your service uh, to our country in those areas as well. That that is amazing. I have this feeling right now, like I should I should confess something. I should declare, you know, I I feel like I, I don't want to keep anything from you. Is that uh, is that is that a natural feeling when people talk to you? Um. Not anymore, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, sometimes people would say things to me like, you know, when they'd come over to give me a quote on a job and they'd say, yeah, you know, don't call, you don't have to call my competitor because we we kind of divvy up the county or whatever. I'm like, I'm not sure you should have said that to me, but um, your secrets are safe with me, Doc. Okay, so good, good. If there's anything you want to unburden yourself, feel free. Feel free. Well, I'll just say that I was I was a former assistant principal, high school assistant principal, and now I'm in HR at the district office. And so the the use of the pregnant pause, I just enjoy the silence because it drives people crazy. They they can't handle silence. There's they feel a need to fill the void. And so I find that when I'm when I'm running an investigation, if I'm quiet long enough, you know, all kinds of stuff comes out. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You gotta watch the body language, you know, eye contact. When somebody says, well, to be honest with you, it's like, <laughs> yeah, you weren't before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, I know there's there's some level of uh, confidentiality, discretion, but what 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 was the most interesting case you worked on, uh, either as a federal prosecutor with the Department of Justice or as uh, assistant attorney general of the state of Con Connecticut? Well, you know, as a as a. Uh, supervisor as the chief of the department i was more supervising at the, for the last 15 or 16 than actually i i did my fair case fair share of cases uh one of the last cases that i started um uh, was a case um i've been on 60 minutes uh for one of my cases Oh, Pops, um, how how far you have fallen from from being on sixty minutes to being on the John freaking Mirpod? I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, you asked me if I'd ever been on the podcast, and I, you know, <laughs> I wasn't going to say no, but I I have been on CBS. <laughs> yeah, so that was an interesting case. It was a, um, uh, it's a it's a case. It's against a, a number of generic drug manufacturers, um, and. One of the things I used to do is I was pretty good at finding cases. And I read an article in the New York Times uh, in 20, the summer of 2014 about a couple of this, uh, one discrete uh, drug, a generic drug that had gone up in price. And generic drugs really shouldn't be going up in price. It's a commodity. It's like water. You know, I mean, it's like your generic, your generic blood thinner and my generic blood thinner are the exact same thing. We just, you make yours and I make, anyways. So this, the only way you compete is on price. So they shouldn't be going up. They should be going down. This drug was going up. thought it was kind of funny. Uh, talked to my best assistant attorney general prosecutor. We talked to the attorney general. We sent out some subpoenas. Uh, long story short, it is now, it's, it's going to trial soon. Um, it is the largest domestic price fixing case in the United States history. And so yeah, it ended up on 60 minutes. This did this involve a a farmer pharma, pharma bro bro pharma bro? No, it's not Martin Shrekley. Okay, okay, I did uh, I Yeah, it was not him. Um but it's all the big companies, all the big yeah. generic drug companies. And yeah, so what started out with three subpoenas turns into hundreds of subpoenas and a lot of documents, a lot of 
damning emails, uh, own records, uh, just a lot of evidence of price fixing, bid rigging, things like that. It was a cool case, but I, you know, I'm out of it now. Yeah. Um, I, I helped start it, but the guy who did all the hard work is he's still there and he's working with a pretty big team. Yeah. Get rich scheme based on the, the suffering and misery of others. Everybody pays for generic drugs, whether you uh, are prescribed them or not, because there's taxpayer funded programs. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably have a family member. If you're not on a generic, everybody's touched by this, these conspiracies, everybody. Well, again, I feel the urge to confess that I'm on a number of uh, generic drugs. So you're probably a victim. Yeah. Where do I file my claim? Stay in touch. <laughs> not over yet. All right. Hey, we're going to take a quick break and hear from the sponsors. When we come back, we're going to get into some uh, peak bagging. And we're going to spend a little time on top of Mount Washington, which I'm really looking forward to. So stay tuned for that. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We were talking to Michael Cole, a.k.a. Pops or Risky or maybe some other trail name yet to, to be uh, landed upon. And we just heard about his background and uh, his service to our country, both in, in the military and also in the, the legal department. And now we're going to move on to some, some adventures out there in the outdoors. And I mentioned Mount Washington before we left. Tell us about uh, your relationship to Mount Washington, Pops. Okay, so, I mean, Mount Washington, home of the world's worst weather. Um, I've been, I've summited it probably close to 20 times, but it's not as boring as it sounds because there's a number of different ways to get up to Mount Washington. Uh, some are just... Um, pretty straightforward trails up. Some are pretty uh, sketchy trails up, like uh, the Huntington Ravine, which I did. Uh, matter of fact, the Huntington Ravine I did this last summer. I think it was my second time. And that was with uh, Stretch and the professor, uh, among others. Um, and I love doing it in the winter uh, because there's no guarantee going to get to the summit in the winter um and uh it's you know a 60 mile per hour day is kind of a, a nice day on mount washington um you know it's that's probably just average i've been up there when it's been a little bit worse um and like i said at the start i'm kind of a small guy so it kind of knocks it could knock you around pretty good but Mount Washington is just an incredible mountain. It's just a very challenging mountain, especially in the winter. It's not for the faint of heart. Uh, and I love doing it, and I love exposing people to it, bringing people up um, up the mountain who haven't really had that opportunity yet. Now, how tall? What, what's, the, what's the altitude of Mount Washington? I think it's a drop over 6,200 feet. 6,200 feet. And so for people on the West Coast, I, I love I love the fact that, that people on the West Coast, they kind of look down their noses at 6,200 feet. They've got the Sierras, right? Maybe even in, in Central, Amer uh, Central America, so in the Central U.S., in the Central U.S. with the Rockies. I mean, you've got 14,000 foot peaks there. You know, they may hear Mount Washington and 6,200 feet and, and, and wonder, what is the big deal? It's only 6,200 feet. What what is it about the topography there that that leads to that bad of weather at the top of Mount Washington? Because you're right, it's it's the worst weather in the world. Yeah, well, I think you know, give or take, two weeks ago when we had that cold spell here, and I kind of kind of travel across the nice, I think Mount Washington was. Uh, around minus 110 degrees and i think it broke u.s records for the coldest day of the year um i can't tell you you know we should have had the i could have channeled the professor because he would have told you precisely why it's the worst in the world but it has to do with kind of where it sets and the convergence of you know the the, the, the airflow from canada from the north atlantic and the south, and it just, it can change on a dime. It could be a bluebird day, and the next thing you know, it's 
sleet and freeze, you know, horizontal snow and whiteout conditions. It just, like I said before, it's like being on the moon. Um, it's, I would much rather hike in those, it's, it's going to sound weird. I'd much rather kind of be up there in, in that kind of a condition, not all the time, than a 60 degree day where I could see a hundred miles and with a light wind. Those are nice, but they're not very, there's not a lot of excitement adventure to it to me. Yeah. 10 point deduction. You're down, on, you're now down to 64. Mm, I fell into that. Yeah. But of your, of your 20 uh, or close to 20 times at the top of Mount Washington, did you ever take the, let's see what it's called. It's called the Mount Washington Cog Railway. No. <laughs> <laughs> no cheating for you. You know, the funny, here's the thing about the Cog Railway. When you're hiking down uh, Washington on the Jewel Trail, you're hiking down the Jewel Trail, the Cog Railway is kind of coming up almost parallel to the Jewel Trail. And you have to actually cross the, the tracks and they're, 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 kind of, they're kind of up high. So you have to like climb over them. But when the Cog Railway passes and you're hiking down, you see all the people in the Cog Railway and they're, they're staring out at you and they're waving to you. Like you're a celebrity, you know, and that's the thing about Mount Washington, as opposed to some of the other presidentials. You know, there's a big observatory at the top, and there's a restaurant at the top, and um, so you guys, you got all the guys like us, and you could drive to the top. You know, there's a tr there's a trailway, and so you you got all these guys, and we get to the top, and you know, everyone wants to take their picture on the summit, and on a nice day, not on a minus fifty degree day. But on a nice day, there's a line at the summit marker, and you've got people with flip flops and dresses and shorts, and then you, you know us ugly, sweaty, dirty hikers are come tromping up. We got to get in line with them, and we got to wait to get our picture taken. There should be two lines. There should be a hiker line and an everybody else line, because it really pisses me off. Yeah, there's something not right about that. I mean, you you should, you have to earn that picture. Yeah, and Erin, no offense, uh, and for some people, they, they can't hike it up, so I get it. But if you get up there on the cog or you drive your Harley up, you should have to, you should, you should wait. You, sh you should defer to the hikers. But it's, it is cool. They're, they're waving to you, and you wave back, and you feel like, you know, you're Hillary or, you know, on Mount Everett or something. <laughs> Now, Mr. Federal Prosecutor, um, when they when they wave to you from the train and you're looking back, do you actually wave back or do you, do you give them another gesture? No, I'm nice. I, I wave. Yeah. Or I ignore. No, usually I'll wave. Yeah. Kucharski yeah. goes the other way, right? Kucharski, uh, <laughs> he's a, he's a, he's a scary looking dude. <laughs> I met him, I met him because we both do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And the first time I met him, I, I looked at him and he's like 6'3 with his long shaggy beard. And I was like, oh, and then he's like ripped, you know? I mean, I looked at him, he was like coming over to me. I'm like, oh, that guy's a scary looking dude. And he grabs your butt with two hands, likes to shake hands with two hands. And he bends over. I'm like, okay, he's like, a, he's like a little sweetheart actually, but he's a scary looking dude. Well, we got to get you three out to the West Coast so I can have a beer with you guys. You, you guys sound very entertaining. And, you know, I, I didn't realize you also did Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I mean, the fact that you did three different warfare schools, served in the military, and now have Brazilian jiu-jitsu, I think that has to be a, you have to be a lethal asset out there on the rugby field. Well, I don't play rugby anymore. There's an old boys team, but I'm too old for the old boys. <laughs> but the cool thing about jiu-jitsu is I've got this whole crew from jiu-jitsu that I've turned on to hiking with me. Um, and they're the ones who kind of gave me the wilderness father name. And, uh, I call them the young guns because they're all under 40 and there must be like eight to 10 of them now, give or take, even to Kucharski, he did some hiking before me, but I'm the one who kind of rekindled his passion. So there's like, I got this whole jujitsu young guns club that, like I said, I like, we, I take them hiking and. and Kind of a neat thing. Nice. The Pied Piper. 
I'm the Pied Piper. That might be it. Pops I'm the Pied Piper. Piper. I'm the Pied Piper going up, but I'm usually the tail end Charlie going down. <laughs> They're way ahead of me. Nice. Any any uh, tales of adventure from your your many trips up to the top of Mount Washington? Oh, tales of adventure. Um, you know, I, I mean, I've been up there uh, in times when it, literally we were the. I think maybe one other team summited one day. It was it was total whiteout conditions. It was it was Jason, not Kucharski, and uh, a couple other people. Um, the only way we made it was because we had GPS. You couldn't use a map and a compass. You couldn't see the cairns. Um, that was a great height. Um, but, you know, I've I, um, there's been times I've had to turn back. Um, probably the only times I never, well, I never, when I did Rainier, I had to turn back too. But, uh, yeah, um, you know the old saying, you know, the summit is optional and getting down is mandatory. Um, and on uh, Washington in the winter, there's a been, you know, I've, I've probably made of my 18 or so summits. I probably uh, attempted Washington in the winter five or six times. And I think I had to turn back twice. It was just too bad. The conditions, conditions were bad. Somebody had a couple of gear malfunctions. So nothing crazy, though. Sorry. Nothing well, That's OK. Don't don't apologize for, for a lack okay. of craziness on top of the most dangerous mountain. Uh, in the states, M- maybe maybe the world, depending on the day, right? So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Rainier. Let's talk about Rainier in, in uh, the state of Washington. How how did you find yourself out there? Is this a uh, a trip that you had planned to get to the top of Rainier? Right. So, um, I took my son to Shasta when he was in high school. And he kind of has a little bit of a knack for or, or a desire for climbing. So when he graduated college, we decided we'd do Rainier together. But I did with a guiding company um, who I've used a few times. So I've, I've done several uh, trips out to the Cascades. Um, and Rainier, we did the Emmons route, um, which is a little bit harder than the Disappointment Cleaver route. Um, and... Summit day, you know, did an alpine start, which means, you know, you get up at like three in the morning, get every, you know, eat your breakfast with your headlamp on, get all roped up. Started going up, started snowing. Um, and um, I think we got to about 13,000, a little over 13,000 feet and Rainier's a little over 14,000 feet. And it was a, it turned into like a total whiteout conditions. And the guy just said, you know what, we're, we're turning back. It's too risky. We were, you know, we were probably an hour from the summit. Um, so we turned back, you know, and at first I was kind of bummed about it. Um, and, you know, whenever this, the first thought is, all right, well, I'm coming back. I'm going to do it again, you know. And one of the guys kind of like pulled me aside and said, look, you did like 90% of the mountain. You've, you know, you did everything but stood on the summit. You know, if you want to come back, we'll take your money. <laughs> we can do this all over again. But there's not much more you're going to get out of it. And he's right. And so I kind of moved on. You know, will I ever do it again? I don't know. There's other mountains to, to climb, you know. And uh, so it was a great experience. Uh, by the time we got back down to the base, not the base camp, the, the next camp, um, that, uh, that whiteout turned into a, just a, a downpour for like the next 12 hours, just in the tent, 12 hours. And uh, it was a long 12 hours with my son, who back then wasn't ta- didn't talk a lot <laughs> in the tent. Uh, so uh, that's my Rainier story. But it, it, it's it's a great, I mean, it's a beautiful mountain. Yeah, yeah, I love you know. I love that. I love that saying that you said, the summit is optional, getting down is mandatory. Um, discretion can be the, the better part of valor in those cases, right? Live to fight another day. How many how many it's, cliches did I just use? Right, three right off the right off my the top of my head. So hiker, my, yeah, hikers and that. yeah, hikers and mountaineers love cliches. <laughs> I got a bunch of them. Very good. Now you also mentioned Shasta. Have you done that multiple times, or just the the one time with your son? Just one time. That's a tough mountain. You know, nobody kind of. Um, that's a that was a steep mountain. He got a little altitude sickness that day, and. Um, 
that's another 14,000 footer glacier travel, alpine start, um, roped up big crevasses. Um, and it was in the summer. So, you know, some of these have very thin ice bridges, snow bridges, and you punch right through. Um, and summited, headed down, and then I kind of, um, on Shasta, I kind of bonked on the way down and uh, had a pretty, that was probably my most scary mountaineering incident occurred on Shasta for me. And what was that? What happened? It was... Yeah, so heading down, um, it was kind of weird. I, I, I kind of, um, maybe I didn't eat enough or drink enough, but I was definitely running out of steam. And uh, kind of a weird thing happened. You know, we, we have our ice axes. And as coming down, my son found an extra ice axe just kind of lying in the snow. So he carried it for a little while, and then he gave it to me. So I'm kind of going down with two ice axes. And um, I slipped and fell on my back. And when I hit the ground, I dropped one of the ice axes. But I still had another ice axe. And then I started to slide on my back, you know, head up, feet down. And I took off like a rocket. And I executed the most perfect rollover self-arrest my only self arrest and um the guide later told me that he saw his whole career flashing before his eyes because <laughs> i stopped probably about you know 20 to 30 feet from just these massive piles of rocks it, it would have been it would have been bad so uh luckily for me he found that ice axe because i don't know if i would have had an ice axe to self arrest with um and when we get to it that will be one of my um pro tip insights of the week but we'll get there always carry an extra ice axe never know when it's going to come in handy know how to use your ice axe because <laughs> a lot of people carry them but they don't know how to use them <laughs> doesn't do a lot of good if you don't know how to use it it looks cool <laughs> yes it does look cool now have you had any training or certification in any kind of mountaineering or self-arresting or uh anything like yeah that? no I, yeah so i've done a lot of um, mountaineering schools besides the military they don't we weren't carrying ice axes back then but i've done a lot of uh a couple schools where you know we learn how to self-arrest self-delay build anchors use crampons uh crevasse rescue uh um uh airy certified level one certification for avalanche uh training awareness so um the interesting thing about that course is you know i can't tell you how many times i probably moved through avalanche terrain and didn't know i was moving through avalanche terrain and then once you take the course you realize it's better to be lucky than good but it's probably better to be smart um and so it really teaches you you know i mean it's a whole science I mean, it is a science and it's like, there's like five levels and I'm like at the first level. So I'm smart enough to know where to get the avalanche information from uh, traveling in the wintertime and kind of how to understand some of the basic information, test it a little bit. And one of the reasons why I do it, why, one of the reasons that led me to get the avalanche certification was I'm taking out all these guys, you know, from jujitsu, they're all young guys, they have young kids, um, uh, and I feel a little bit of responsibility. We were going to do a trail once called the slide, which I've done before, which is like avalanche. It, it's like pro so prone to avalanche. And the first time I did it, I didn't even realize it. It's just this snow on top of this big slab, smooth slab on this high angle. I mean, it's just waiting for. And we were supposed to do it with Kucharski. I don't think Jason and a couple other guys. And um, I said, you know what, guys? It, it had snowed a lot a few days before. I said, I, I just don't feel comfortable doing this. And we, we ended up doing a different hike. And then I said, I got to take a course because these guys follow me like the Pied Piper. And I don't want to believe them into something that's going to turn into a, a, you know, a bad day for everybody. 
Yeah, another. So I, I got up some training. Yeah. yeah, another cliche is you know ignorance is bliss, right? And and that stems from you know in in any field, there's what you know, there's what you don't know, and then there's what you you don't even know that you don't know. And that's usually like a huge mountain of information that you, you're just completely ignorant of. You you realize that there's some stuff that you don't know, but there's this this whole other mountain of material that you don't even know that you, you don't know about it. And this, what you've just described, you know, walking happily along in, in perfect avalanche country, completely oblivious, thinking everything is just fine and dandy. And that, that's a very dangerous situation. If you, and if you're going to, if, if you are interested in activities that uh, go to the, the far right side of the risk continuum, you're going to want to educate yourself. So that you, you know what you're getting yourself into and you know what you're getting others into. hundred percent, you know, um, and, you know, that's why in the winter, I, I mean, like you could have avalanches in, 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 in the tree line. If it's, if there's enough snow and the angles, right. And, you know, you don't even think, you think about it like avalanche when it's like out in the open, but you can have it in the tree line and, Putting aside the people that we talked about earlier on the podcast who have no clue and are totally unprepared, then you have the people who think they're prepared, who carry the ice axe around and wouldn't know how to use it if they had to, or travel across avalanche terrain, or forget to check the weather report. And just you know, just some simple common sense thing, or you know, maybe I mean, if you're going to carry an ice axe, common sense things nowadays. If you don't have enough money or the time to go to school, get on YouTube, you know, go outside on the golf course. Next time it snows with your ice axe, watch a YouTube video and practice. Because I'm telling you, a lot of those people, maybe not out West, but here, who carry the ice axe, I bet you they have no idea how to use it. Okay. Which brings us to the question, how do you properly use an ice axe? Well, um, we're, we're not we're not at the pro tip. We're kind of jumping the gun. So if I yeah, if I yeah. steal your thunder here, I'll, I'll I'll forgive it. But I you know I think this is the logical time to talk about how do you use an ice axe. Correctly. Well, I'll try to describe it. I mean, you want to have the ice axe in your uphill hand. So, um, and if you're looking to have it for what's called a self arrest, then the way it's turned is the uh, not the pick end. You know, the sharp end, that's that's facing to the rear. And the ads, that little curved blade is facing to the front. And you, you're gripping it right at the stem in between the ads and the pick. And if you're going to fall on your stomach, if, you, if your feet slide out from under you, you're literally going to bring the ice axe up to your chest. So now that pick, remember, the pick is facing the rear. Well, if you bring it up to your chest, now the pick is facing down. You grab the um, the uh, where is it or well, whatever the stem of the of the ice axe um, uh, the shaft and you fall and you turn your head so you don't get hit by the ice axe and you dig it into the ground and you pull up and you know you make a solid contact. That's if you fall on your stomach with your head up. That's how you use an ice axe. Um, the, the trick is, like I told you before, sometimes you fall on your back. Sometimes you fall on your stomach, head down. Sometimes you fall on your back, head down. So there's all different positions, and you got to learn how to kind of maneuver that ice axe. Because you don't always fall like you're going to fall on your stomach. But that's the basic way to learn is on your stomach. And uh, it works. So when you're driving the ice axe into the snow to, to self-arrest, what part of the ice axe is going in? The pick. The pick. The, 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 the sharp, narrow end. Mm -hmm. There's the pick, the adds, the spike, that's the pointy part on the bottom, mm -hmm. and the shaft. And if it's really deep snow and you catch yourself really quick, you can do something called a self-belay, which is when you just plant the whole ice axe uh, um, uh, just jam it right into the snow. Shaft first. Shaft first, and mm -hmm. you want to get it really deep, and that'll hold you. But if you if you can't do that, then and you start to slide, then it's a self arrest situation. 
dicey stuff. Good to know. If you've got that ice axe, it's not just for looks. Know how to use it. That's right. Okay. But they make great pictures on the summit when you hold it up. <laughs> you got to, you know, looking good is, you know, it's part of that. That's right. That's right. Now, Pied Piper, have you also done any hiking in Alaska? I did. Yeah, I was up in Alaska in May of 21 for 10 days up on, it's called the Kahitna Glacier, which is in um, uh, uh, Denali National Park. It's probably about 10 miles from Denali. I did a couple mountains up there. Um, beautiful country, cool, cool place. Fly in on one of those uh, planes with the skids on the bottom, and uh, you fly over the mountains. You fly through the mountains. It's pretty neat. Any any aspirations to do Denali eventually? So my window uh, <laughs> for climbing Denali is probably closing. Um, meaning I'm you know getting on. Um, I mean, I think I'm still physically fit enough to do it. So uh, it's on the bucket list. I was actually going to do it this summer, but there was I might have had to, for a while, look like I was heading for some uh, shoulder surgery. Um, but I've been able to kick the can down the road and not do the shirt surgery yet. But um, it's on the list. It's it's. I would say it's, it's either going to be Aconcagua, that's in uh, Argentina, Denali, or maybe um, there's another mountain in Canada called Mount Logan, which is like the second highest mountain in North America. It's not as well known, it's a little more remote, and it's not as much of a scene as Denali is in the summer. Denali is like a mini Everest. You, know, like, you could have like 50 teams on Denali in a summer, and Mount Logan might have like two. It's kind of a cool, yeah, so nobody knows about it, but that's on one of those three is kind of on my list. Or this summer? No, not this summer. No, not this it, summer. It's too, it's too soon now. Not enough okay. time. All right. So let, let's put it on the list for next summer, and let's put some pressure on uh, Kenosha and, and Kacharski to get out there with you. I also hike with Kenosha's uh, older brother, Adam. He's a, he's a former Marine, too, our, our Marine. Um, so, yeah, he would do it. Kacharski would, you know, he'll just run up it and run down it, and so would Jason. Yeah, there, like are, the, the, there are no former Marines. They're they're all they're just Marines. Just Marines. Yeah. That's right. I know. That's we're, right. We're, yeah. All right. Hey, tell me about the the radio control tower in Alaska. Yeah, so radio control tower, it's probably about somewhere in between, maybe it's about eighty five hundred feet. Um, it's probably about two or three miles from uh the Hilton the base camp. Hilton Base Camp is where everybody starts in alley. You know, that's just, that's the long trek from. And so um, it's a cool little mountain. Um, you know, you got to cross Glacier to get to it. You got to cross crevasses to get to it. Um, it's got a pretty near the summit. Um, there's a, um, a pretty narrow kind of a. A ridge a ridge line to get to it. I mean, it's maybe two or three feet wide. Tops, you know, you can easily fall to your right or fall to your left. You're definitely roped up. But then it's nice. It has a nice little flat summit. I do not know how uh, it's it's got its name, but it's kind of got this cool knife edge trail leading to the summit that uh, you definitely want to be paying attention. So it was a nice little climb. Great view. Beautiful. You know, we were able to see. That was a bluebird day. There was not. Uh, 60 mile whiteout condition there. So Pops, am I to understand that there's actually no radio control tower there? There's no, there's no, there's nothing on the summit. There's no, you know, you can't get a cup of hot cocoa. You couldn't take the, uh, the railroad. Couldn't take the railroad up there. Yeah, I don't know how it got its name. It's kind of a. We need we need Jason. The professor would tell us. That's for sure. Yeah. All right. Hey, Pops, you know where we are right now? Uh, no. We have the pro tip of the week? The pro tip insight of the week. That's right. You hit the nail right on the head. It's time for you to share some more trail wisdom with our listeners to make their next outdoor experience even better. So we heard about the ice axe. 
I apologize for stealing that thunder early. Do you have something else you want to share? Uh, all right. So that was one of my pro tips. I don't get credit for that, right? I, I told you, I give, I, I would, I would show you some, some grace there. I'll give you credit for that. Okay. So I guess one, one pro tip is I'll give you two quick ones. The first one is again, winter hiking. Um, and I've learned this from experience is do not just follow when it's, when it's uh, during a winter hike, you know, because do not assume that the, the tracks in front of you know where they're going. You definitely want to, uh, if you have your GPS, if you have your map, you definitely every, you know, 15, 30 minutes, 500 yards, whatever you want, want to do, check your, you know, check where you are. Don't assume that the person in front of you knows the route because it's happened to me and I've heard stories where that person is lost. <laughs> and, you know, if you're just kind of mindlessly following the snowshoe tracks or the whatever footprints in front of you, that could be a little bit of a recipe for disaster. And it happened to me and a couple of buddies of mine where we followed these guys, this, these tracks for hours. And then we came upon them in the bottom of a gully. And it was like four o'clock in the winter. And they turned uh, us and said, you guys have a map? And we said, yeah. They said, good, because we're lost. <laughs> so that's pro tip number two, right? Or one. That is Check fantastic. your bearing. That is, okay. that is fantastic. Uh, news flash to everybody out there that not all that you encounter are, are the sharpest tools in the shed, in the outdoors. There's a lot of great people out there, but but just following them blindly can get you into, into a tough spot. Yeah. And in the winter, you know, he got, and then it got dark on my trip, you know, and then we had to find where we were heading, which was not fun. And the other quick one is if you're going to carry, carry a map and know how to use the map, know how to, you know, shoot, know how to use, do a resection, know how to do an intersection with your compass, know how to use it. It's, I guess I'm, I'm a big fan of if I'm going to carry something, I'm going to know how to use it, not just carry it. That's right. Don't just stand at the top of the, of the summit uh, with your ice axe in one hand and your compass and map in the other, thinking this is going to make a great uh, photo opportunity. Know how to use those things. Know how to use your tools. Very good. That right those, there. That's my that, pro tip. That is the pro. That encompasses everything. So fantastic. All right. So there you have it. That's it. This episode is just about in the books. Hope our listeners enjoyed our time with Pops. Want to thank him for joining us this week. Michael, how can our listeners keep up with you on social media and where can they find updates about your latest adventures? Well, um, that's going to be hard to do, Doc, because I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. Um, so I guess if you wanted to friend me, I do post pictures and um, uh, and you know some videos of some of these trips. Other than that, Slim Pickens. Yeah. Yeah. How about do you have a, a MySpace page? Maybe something <laughs> maybe maybe something on, on Pinterest. I don't know. Well, you know, if they go next time they go to the supermarket, they look on the bulletin board, maybe there'll be a little uh tea and some kits and they can give me a phone call. That's right. If you want to follow Pops, keep your eyes peeled for the the uh, cork boards uh, for some some chits that you can tear off to to call in and find out what his latest adventure has been. That that's call on that rotary phone. Yep. <laughs> on rotary phone, people again. People are like, "What's what's a rotary phone?" So, yeah. All right. Hey, remember to check out the pod on social media. We do have uh, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And if you have comments or clips you want to share. You can send it to me at johnfreakamir at gmail.com. The Adventure Media Recommendation. Pops, I'm also looking to you to share a recommendation for a book, a movie, documentary, website, some kind of uh, adventure media to keep our listeners connected to the trail. We call this our, our Adventure Media Recommendation. Any any suggestions for us? Um. I mean, everybody's seen all the documentaries, the, the big the big ones. Um, I read a book after I got back from Alaska called, called The Comfort Crisis. Um, I think the, the, the author, um, 
Michael Easter, as in the holiday Easter. And it's kind of a cool book. It's it's really about how it to sum it up is you need to learn to be comfortable in uncomfortable places. And it's how uh too much of society gets too comfortable and you gotta get out there and you gotta challenge yourself. And he tells some pretty cool stories about you know living in Alaska for 30 days and some of the other ventures that he's done. And the whole theme is, you know, that's, you know, our, our ancestors were uncomfortable and they survived. And if you really want to live life, you want to get out there and, and be uncomfortable, learn to be comfortable in uncomfortable place. So it's a, it's a good book, The Comfort Crisis. Love it. I think that is most appropriate. We've heard on this podcast many times from, from different people that the key, uh, to enduring and doing these great things is, is finding a way to be comfortable while being uncomfortable, you know, embrace the suck is uh, the short answer to that. Yep. Okay. Attitude determines altitude. Very good. What have we not asked you? All right. And before we wrap things up, just one more segment for you called, what have I not asked you that you're dying to tell us about? What do we miss tonight? I do have a, uh, I allegedly have a trail named after me in Hokkaido, Japan. Really? How, how, I'm full how did of, that happen? I'm full of surprises, Doc. You are. Uh, so um, in a nutshell, uh, in the Marine Corps, uh, we were doing an exercise with the Japanese Self-Defense Force winter uh, Hokkaido, you know, where the Winter Olympics was in 1972, which... I don't know if anybody's this is who's from live then, but anyways, uh, and um, I was the liaison officer. I was embedded with the Japanese, so I wasn't with the the Marines. I was with the Japanese, and they did a movement to contact on this trail. I had a I had a Marine interpreter with me and a Marine radio man. Everybody else was Japanese, and. The radio man and the uh, interpreter stayed in the Articlat. And this is like a 20 mile ski march. And I was the first American to do it. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of like ups and downs and mountain, you know, uh, skiing down mountains, things like that. And I got to the bottom and uh, there was a Marine, uh, a Japanese general who was the general uh, commanding the Japanese Self-Defense Force in Hokkaido. I think it was a three, I don't think they have stars, but whatever it was, chrysanthemums, some kind of flower. And uh, he congratulated me. Uh, he gave me a gift, took a really cool picture. Um, I could send it to you um, with the camouflage, you know, the white camis and all that. And he said, we're going to name the trail after you. Because you're the first Marine to ever, the first American to ever do it. And, um, you know, I never went back and checked and, uh, if it's actually true, but that's what he said. At least that's what I heard. So, so you're not sure if he, if he was blowing smoke, but I can tell from just from the way you told this story pops that of all the things that you've accomplished in your life, this is one of the, one of the, the prouder moments. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, uh, you know, like I said, my radio man and, and the other guy, they just wanted to, they had no interest in getting out of that snow cat. And I hung in there with those guys, but I had, you know, this is like a year after I went to the school in Norway. So I knew how to ski by then. That was a pretty good shape. And there was no riff, there was no effing way, excuse me, that I was riding in that snowcat. <laughs> you know, I was going up that mountain and I was going down that mountain. I fell a lot, but I did it. You had that in your back pocket, the Norwegian training. Those Norwegians did you right. They did. They did. All so, right. Well, hey, Michael, that is a wrap from the John Freaky Muir studio. Any shout outs to friends and family? Uh, I got a shout out to my wife. because She lets me do all this stuff and my kids uh, who come with me every once in a while. And my hiking crew, the Young Guns, Joseph, Kucharski, Jason, um, and some of the older guys that I hike with, too. So but, and and um, we didn't talk about it, but uh, unfortunately, the, the Open Doors Outdoors. Davey Edwards, who's the exec, uh, executive director, who um, 
it's a nonprofit for veterans with some mental health issues, PTSD and uh, um, anxiety and depression. And one of the things I do in retirement is um, they, they like to get these guys out into uh, nature and do some hikes. And I, I one of their tri- I'm one of their trip leaders for the White Mountains. And I take I, I lead hikes in the White Mountains. So shout out to Open Doors Outdoors. That's nonprofit. fantastic. If if people want to learn more about Open Doors Outdoors, where, where can they find more information? Yeah, uh, opendoorsoutdoors.org. Um, great organization. It really, you know, it's it's takes care of veterans uh, and their families. Um, you know, the studies have shown you, you you know this better than I do. You get out in nature, it changes your brain, and um, it really is something that we see some uh, really incredible benefits for these guys to kind of get out. We do an easy hike, we do a moderately challenging hike, and then they kind of graduate to, you know, a white mountain hike. And I kind of lead those hikes now. So I'm lucky, lucky for me, I hooked up with them in, in retirement. I get to, to hike and I'm a vet and I can give back. Living the dream. Thank you so much for that, Michael. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Always remember the trail is the trail. Doesn't care if you want to go downhill. Doesn't care if it's almost dark and you're looking for a campsite. It doesn't even care if you have to stand behind the guy in flip-flops as you wait your turn for a picture at the summit. The trail Mm -hmm. is the trail. Embrace the suck.